Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic uh, opening presentation. So if we could now welcome um, Dr. Dan Sado, who's a consultant cardiologist at King's, who's also going to be talking about uh, the MIR, MRI and red flags in this uh, long COVID. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I think firstly, can I say thank you to the charity? Um, so I've sort of been uh, watching the charity and sending patients in your direction. I think it's probably with about 2014, I think, 2013. Fantastic. And I'm very grateful. And it's very nice for me to be able to give something back. So I'm going to open up. This is the fourth time I've showed this slide. Every time I, I get the same feeling, I sit in that chair thinking I'm going to show Boris Johnson. So <laughs> what if you just said to me a year ago, you're going to make a slide with him on? I never would have believed it. So why am I? Why have I put him on the slide here? Because actually, much as I'm not a massive fan, I have some sympathy for him from March 2020. In March 2020, the good news prime minister, everything's wonderful. We got the oven ready. Yeah, everything's wonderful. I had to sit down and say, yeah, you know, I told you all that. Don't leave your house. <laughs> right. That must have been quite hard for him. That goes against everything that he was. In my view, everything he stands for. If you watch me talk about MRI in pretty much any forum, you'll hear a Boris S debate of here's why we're wonderful. Everything we do is amazing. Send us loads of work, except this talk. And every time I do this talk, I kind of think of Boris and think, it must have been hard for him because I find this talk difficult to do. And you'll see why. So I'm going to go through mindset changes with COVID-19, talk about myocarditis and pericarditis, refer back to the patient and talk about OMS and OMS. This slide says, apologies to radiology. The first time I did this uh, talk was for a cardiac MRI conference where we have a mixture of cardiologists and radiologists. So mainly for cardiologists, but for any general physician, really, you have a patient on ITU who gets a troponin measured severe septic shock, and it comes back very mildly elevated. Normal the next day, ITU called the cardiology registrar for advice. Does that troponin interest you in terms of clinical care? What would you do with this? And rather than asking all of you, I can tell you what two and a half thousand people thought of this on Twitter. 83% not interested. In fact, I got lots of things on Twitter saying, can I apologize on behalf of the ITU community that we would bother you with this? I was like, this was a made up, this was a made up case. This is not real, you know, sort of. Thing. It was to make a point uh, for this talk, for the talk as it was going to be uh, when I first did it about six months ago. Most cardiologists weren't interested, but that, that question is as much about philosophy as it is about science. Something's happened. You when a troponin goes up, you've had a leak of it from somewhere. Why didn't we care? And of course, what is different is that in April 2020, when that phone call was made to the cardiology registrar, they couldn't get to ITU quicker. COVID changed our way of thinking. We started looking, oh, that might be interesting. My first, uh, I had a paper published in the European Heart Journal, pericardial effusion on MRI. That is not interesting on MRI. I, I'm going to go back to London Bridge in a minute and scan somebody who's got a pericardial effusion. Thousands of units around the world will be doing that every day. I've got a high impact publication because it was the first COVID pericardial effusion that was published. It's completely changed the way of thinking uh, for physicians. And the reason I bring it up when I say this to CMR reports, cardiac MRI reports, change the way that we thought as well. Borderline calls, and you know, it might be interesting, I'll take a little bit more notice of this, maybe than you might have done in 2019 with a similar sort of referral for a similar sort of thing with some other virus. So you had a mindset change. So, okay, well, all of that, why, are you, why is MRI of interest in myocarditis? So we can look at LV function, echo can do that too. What we can do that echo can't is look at inflammation and, and echo really struggles with scarring. So we come into our own for myocarditis. This has been, MRI has been used for myocarditis long before COVID. Here's a patient who actually had a hospital. Uh, so he was in hospital with COVID-19. Here you're seeing left ventricle, the muscle is on the outside here. This is the cavity. Uh, so the gray, lighter gray stuff here is blood pool. The contraction of the heart's all right. It's a little bit down here. We can do inflammatory imaging, which is brighter here in the lateral wall. And we can give contrast that takes, you can basically see dabbing in contrast there. So I won't dwell on this, but that basically shows you myocarditis in a patient who was actually quite sick. And we can look at peri the pericardium very well as well. Look at thickness, 
effusions, constrictive physiology, and pericardial inflammation. So, of course, you know, we are a good tool for these problems. So people thought, well, they're a good tool for this. Let's start looking at what you find in COVID-19. And here's where the fun begins. The first study in 2020 took predominantly people who never made it to hospital with COVID. This is in Germany. Uh, this is not in the UK. So 67% of people in, were in the community. 78% of people had an abnormal MRI. Now, most of this audience now will have had COVID, just by statistics. I lost my COVID virginity a month ago. So I'm in there, right? This study is saying there's a 78% chance I'm going to have an abnormal cardiac MRI. Press everybody in this room, if they come, come back with me to London Bridge in a minute, according to this study, he's going to have an abnormal MRI. That caused big news. This study was widely quoted. I forget, it's, it's had, I think last I looked, it had over half a million people look at it. When we published up an MRI, most of you aren't interested, right? <laughs> Completely changed. So you get that when you start. And then you've got a college athletics one was quite a lot in there, and another one here. And these were all in 2020. This study here looks at patients who were actually sick in hospital who were troponin positive, a much higher potential yield. Only 27% had myocarditis. So you're really sick group. You've already suddenly starting to see a much lower number than what you've got here. And down the bottom here, this is actually from UCL, uh, from the group that Toby works with you actually saw no difference between controls and patients. I would say patients, these are actually healthcare professionals who had COVID. So you've gone from basically everybody in this room is gonna have a problem to nobody in this room is gonna have a problem. Ouch. So your problem number two here is you have got grossly conflicting literature in this field. It makes it extremely difficult. So whatever paper you choose to read, you know, they have two very different stories. Yeah. And part of the problem is how do you actually diagnose myocarditis? There's no guidance, there's guidelines for how you do it on MRI, but not outside of that. So your typical patients, if I if sort of nick up here now, say, describe what myocarditis means to you. Nick would think the patient who comes into hospital with chest pain, troponin positive, has a normal angiogram, then comes to me for an MRI scan and we say it's myocarditis. That was your tip, that's what typically cardiology would have called particularly viral myocarditis in the past. That's what you would have expected. But that's, there's no actual guideline saying that's how you do it sort of thing. And in fact, in Germany, if you go into hospital like that, the majority of people get cardiac biopsy, which we don't do in the UK or in most other countries. So of course, biopsy is your gold standard, but it often misses it. So if you see it, great. Specificity, very good. Sensitivity, limited. So what then happens to people with myocarditis? If you look at our groups, I work, we have a myocarditis clinic. This is pre-COVID. If you look at 100 patients who came to us with definite myocarditis, probably viral. So of course, sometimes we come, today, today you come to hospital, you get a swab for every virus you can think of. Before 2020, you never got a swab. Or if you did get a swab, it was often a bit late and it wasn't done, but it was a completely different world. So the majority of these people probably had a virus, but we don't know. The story sounded like viral infection. 100 patients, the majority came in unwell, chest pain. By the time you follow them up, the chest pain, everything's gone away. So you can generally see with viral myocarditis pre-COVID that you've got some ongoing grumbling chest pain in patients who definitely had myocarditis. And in fact, in my line of work, I do a lot of work in autoimmune disease uh, with a group of patients called polymyositis and dermatomyositis. My research is looking at myocarditis in this group. We go looking for it with troponins and MRI. When we find stuff, nearly always the patient has no symptoms. We tell them they've got it. They don't come to us and say, I've got chest pain, I might have it, sort of thing. So this sort of low level myocarditis in, in this sort of group of patients doesn't cause symptoms. I would say this, this sort of group of patients often on immune suppression, it's not necessarily directly comparable, but just to give you some idea. Pericarditis is easier because there's European guidelines that tell you how to diagnose it. So there's a whole load of diagnostic criteria. And this is important because if you look at what uh, some of the patients I see have had done, there's kind of every sort of one, two, three, and four have been forgotten and everything's been come down to this bit here, which is the additional supportive finding that an MRI is suggesting something. And all of this sort of goes, well, the rest of it, I'm just going to call it that. I take uh, Toby's comment about William Osler. Here. The patient's telling you a story that sounds nothing like pericarditis going to end up with a big jump saying that's what it is if everything's normal apart from some minor thing on MRI. It's a big jump now. 
So issue number three, and I haven't gone into this in detail just because there isn't time. MRI is not easy to do in the cohort of patients we're talking about with post-COVID syndrome. Doing inflammatory imaging on patients who are female is more difficult. The reason for that is because the myocardium is thinner and therefore you need better resolution to image it, particularly in younger females. If you're older and hypertensive, not so much, but younger females, harder to image. Fast heart rates adds complexity to that. Of course, many post-COVID syndrome patients have got faster heart rates. Makes it more difficult because the scan is trying to get information, information with the heart being more dynamic, makes it more difficult to do. A lot of the techniques we use were validated looking at just imaging the septum. Here, we're trying to look at other bits of the heart and some of the older imaging we do, something called STIR is more difficult, and particularly again in this group. So we have some challenges with it. So if I to keep back to the patient, 37 year old female, heavy chest pain. And I do, uh, I run some of the cardiology um, side of long COVID or post COVID syndrome uh, in Southeast Thames. Quite often this sort of referral to me, I would change it slightly. What I would often be asked to see is this patient's been told they've got pericarditis or myocarditis. They've been given colchicine often. It hasn't worked. They may or may not have tolerated prednisolone. Can we offer something else? And the reason the referrals come to me is because people know that I work with a rheumatologist who has an interest in this with all sorts of funny antibody type treatments. What would I do with that? And actually, my approach to this it often is difficult because what the patient doesn't expect is we start again. And we go through everything from first principles. And you find all sorts of stuff with this. You may completely agree with what somebody else thought, or you may find that the patient's had a history taken, no examination, no blood test, no ECG. And someone's just plonked them through an MRI scan and said, you've got pericarditis. And you think, hang on, there's a whole load of diagnostic criteria you haven't even looked for here. You know, the story might sound good, might sound bad with the history. So I will start again with this and go through it all again and may come to my own decision. What do I think? And this is part of the problem, actually, with what Toby was saying about the generalist. He can't do this bit. <laughs> so the generalist is fine, but you need a mixture. And it's the same. I mean, our long COVID clinic, the picture we put on the end, I think actually beautifully sums up for me what I think about post-COVID syndrome. Lots of people are, need to be involved. You saw the pick lots of the same as our post-COVID service. So you need lots of people involved with this, because some of this is just really technical, and you just need someone who's technically orientated to say to you, actually, I've looked at this MRI scan, and I think it's normal, or I think it's gross, <clears throat> grossly abnormal. Because there's a real problem here, and we see this in our myocarditis clinic, what we call ops and, ops and moms, where we sometimes find that we think these things have been overcalled. Labels have been given that we don't necessarily agree with. This big decision making. You want to put somebody on site to that's not a minor thing, for example. So, you know, it's a big call to get the diagnosis right uh, in the first place. We may agree, we may not. But as I say, we start again with this. So, what about the red flag side of it, which was the aim of the talk? This is hard in myocarditis. Arrhythmia, definitely a red flag. Anyone who's arrhythmic post COVID, I think generally be thinking about why is that happening? It may be that they don't have myocarditis. Ones that I've seen in the more chronic setting, quite often this has been where it starts. In fact, I've got a case of post-COVID myocarditis who I'm seeing next week, uh, who I know very well. She never had chest pain. She presented with, I think, an 8% ventricular ectopic burden because her presentation was quite distressed by it. And she's been running a mildly elevated troponin, but has no chest pain and has never had chest pain. Pericarditis, the red flag. For me, for me, it's this, you know, people have forgotten that, you know, this is what pericarditis is. And if it sounds nothing like any of this that's on the screen, it's a big jump to then say, let's have some cyclophosphamide. It's a big jump. So from my perspective, you know, I think this is a useful, the ESC guidelines here can be very helpful. So bottom line, a difficult talk, because I'd love to have got and said, just send everybody with chest pain to me. <laughs> you know, I'll sort it out for you, no problem at all. This is some of the hardest stuff I do. It is much, much easier dealing with gross pathology than some of the more subtle stuff that often you're talking about here. Much, much easier. Because there's a whole load of textbooks that say to you, when it looks like this, this is what it is. I've got 100 cardiologists in the room and they'll all agree. You can see from the stuff on the myocarditis. The reason why you're seeing the gross change in myocarditis literature is not different in patients, in my view. It's just to do with the way people are calling abnormality on scans. Some groups are saying this is just in the normal spectrum, some are not. That is the real challenge because a lot of what you're seeing is quite subtle. 
So for me, a lot of it is about first principles with this. Some of it's difficult because as Toby's starting to suggest, you know, this is a new disease. Do first principles work with this? But for me, pericarditis, for example, is what it is. I don't think COVID pericarditis per se, you know, why would it not, if your pericardium's inflamed, why would the nature of the chest pain you get to be different with that to what it used to be with, you know, influenza pericarditis sort of thing? I think the symptoms the patient's going to get probably with it are likely to be the same. And the concern always for us is that there's potential to overcall in the desire to want to label. And then think, oh, now I've labeled you, I can give you culture, I can give you cytoplasm, I can do stuff. But you've got to make sure the diagnosis is right. So in effect, as an MRI, I'm doing MRI, for me, it's all about diagnosis. A lot of what I'm doing in life is about trying to get the diagnosis right. That's the end. Thank you Thank very you. much. Again, that's up for this uh, presentation. And um, we know that I think you need to, to leave. Yeah. Here, so if you're able to take just yeah, a couple please, of yeah. questions, um, if we perhaps start in the hall if anyone's got any any questions um can, can i take 50 pounds at this point as a bet with you to say that i won't get 60 questions on, uh, <laughs> on the online because that's far too specialist that's as well we but... one from online here. Um, yeah, so it's for you fellow cmr cardiologists between the studies is yes. there any difference between the covid strain studies i.e delta on the front does um one strain cause more so mode? yeah yes so I don't think there's any question that if you look at what you're seeing in the current strain, the Omicron is obviously very different to what we saw originally. If you go back to, if you go back to this, this is obviously looking at the original strain. This is going to be looking at the alpha strain. But so it, could it be a difference between the two? Yeah, possibly. I don't think that's what it is, because both those strains were clearly extremely aggressive. Uh, as somebody who, uh, like with Nick, ended up in a hospital that saw an awful lot of problems. Both strains cause the same sorts of things. I do think you've got a big change between Omicron and the rest. But the, what you're seeing there is going to be, because it's, that's published, uh, I think, in summer 21, uh, the bottom study. So it's going to have been stuff that happened with the, the January 21 wave. So, yeah, I mean, it may be that. I don't think that's what it is. I mean, I, let me put it another way. If you look at what, if the original study is true, I should be seeing an avalanche of disasters now, which I'm not. If you're really saying 78% of people in the original wave ran into problems, we would be seeing a shed load of things that we are not seeing. It's possible that maybe lots of people get lots of mild things that don't matter, but we are not seeing disasters. Thank you very much. Uh, any other, other questions in the room? Anyone want to make a comment to otherwise we're right online? Yes, um, we could ask about, um, the tachycardia yep. with long COVID yes. and whether you also see people with both um, bradycardia and tachycardia. Um, much more common to see tachycardia related issues. I mean, Nick will be more expert on this mm. than me, but if you look at certainly what I've seen, nearly all of it is much more related to tachycardia related issues. Bradycardia related issues, I'm trying to think if I've seen anyone where I've ever thought, oh, gosh, it's a bit slow for some reason that I don't understand. It's nearly always the other way. Um, and you know, why is this conference running on the POTS UK? Because exactly, I think, you know, it, it is much more likely to be tachycardia related issues. I, can't, I think I've seen anything in Nick's sort of shaking his head here as well. So no, I don't, maybe that might be a loaded question from someone who is that way inclined. So I don't know, they, they're more than welcome to email me if they want to, uh, uh, to have some email discussion about it, but I can't think of anyone I've seen. Um, okay, well, thank you so much.